Okay, folks, let's uh, settle in and we'll, uh, we'll get the show on the road. Uh, so thanks everybody for coming out today. We have a, a very special guest, Michael Tadros. Um, so as many of you know, the, when people hear a movie producer, the, word, the term can mean a lot of different things, right? There's a lot of different aspects of the job. There's many different kinds of producers. Element of sleaze. <laughs> <laughs> Your words, not mine. Um, so, the, you know, the producer can mean a lot of things. Uh, and nobody really can do everything that there is to, to being a producer, but this man does more than most. Um, what's you. especially impressive is that he comes out of, he's the kind of producer who you can truly, he's really as much of a filmmaker as the famous director he's worked with. He started off in the trenches, so to speak, from the ground level, the daily grind of production as a production uh, manager, as first as an assistant production director. Production assistant. Production assistant. Production assistant, PA, uh, assistant director, production manager. So he learned by actually making movies, which is, again, true of all producers. He, uh, from running a set to overseeing crew, making sure his shows come in on budget and on time. Uh, and then he's moved up to become a production executive at a major studio and now a very successful independent producer. Uh, his accomplishments are incredibly impressive. I'm gonna, it's, I'm gonna read a partial list of credits. It's gonna sound as if I'm just throwing out random titles from like the most successful Hollywood movies of the last 30 years. Um, but as, a, as an assistant director and a production manager, uh, his movies included Coming to America, Black Rain, Ghost. Uh, he was for several years the uh, vice president and executive in charge of production at Paramount, where he oversaw the production of The Firm, uh, Forrest Gump, the Wayne's World movies, Searching for Bobby Fischer, and many, many others. And as a producer and executive producer, his credits include Die Hard with a Vengeance, or Die Hard 3, uh, The Thomas Crown Affair, uh, Hitch and I Am Legend with Will Smith, Ocean's 8, his most recent production, uh, the Sherlock Holmes reboot, Gangster Squad, and many, many others. We are very, very lucky to have him here. He's a proud Wagner alum, so he's actually happy to be here too. Uh, but we're especially happy. So with no further ado, uh, let's welcome Michael Tadros. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I love being here. I, I haven't been here since 1973, so it's been a while. But they have the place, nothing's been painted or changed, I noticed. It's been <laughs> pretty much when I left it. Um, when, I, when I lecture at UCLA, basically, I just talk about how I got into business and how I started and where, how I got to where I am. And then everybody asks me questions, and that's kind of the whole thing, because the rest of my life is pretty boring. You don't want to know about all the wives or any, you know, none of that means anything. <laughs> you know, how many millions are given away, none of that matters. It just matters what's about the film. And is everybody here film students? The vast majority, yeah. And can I ask you why you want to be, why, why you want to be in the film business? <clears throat> the easiest way to get into the business is to write something that people want. That's how the Zucker Brothers did it, Jim Abrams did it, John Landis did it. So many people did it that way. Um, why do you guys want to be in film business? Uh, mostly just to kind of share my uh, thoughts on life and hope other people are kind of like touched by it or like it or just, influenced it in some way. But remember, they have to be commercial thoughts on life. Commercial because thoughts. if they don't make money, nobody's going to yeah, bring it back. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a. Yes? Oh, I just said, that was just going to continue on the question. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Um, I think that when I like edit or produce films or like, just shoot film, there's something in me that almost kind of is like hyped up. Like some people get a run or just watch and things like that. That's the kind of thing I get every single time I make something. I think that harnessing that and some kind of ask the film business is a great way to make something worthwhile. And that makes people remove their thoughts for even just having time. So I really want to do that kind of influence. That's really smart because. If you don't have a good time, don't do it. Whatever career you choose, if you're not enjoying it, I've never had a job really in my life. I, I truly, I have never really, I don't really think I've ever worked hard in my life. I've just done, when you do things, like if you go play golf and put a lot of effort into it, you know, is that working? But you're putting effort and time into it. And that's kind of like this business. Effort and time, but you enjoy every day of it, and the rewards are ridiculous. They could throw, Millions of dollars at you. It's just ridiculous. And so <clears throat> I like it for the reason I never felt as though I had a job my whole life. And you make a fortune of money, don't you? 
I mean, what else are you in life for, you know? And then and the perks, the perks, forget the perks. I know professors hate to hear this shit, I know. That's great. Uh, <laughs> the perks are th through the roof, what you, what you get in the entertainment world. I mean, I started when I got out of Wagner in 1973. And I was a production assistant at Gulf I used to run for donuts and coffees before that. It was like before Starbucks and all those places. I had to go to little Greek diners and buy all this stuff and take it to the cruise. And um, we did it was all the black exploitation movies in those days. I did Hell Up in Harlem, Black Caesar, Superfly, Savage Sisters, uh, Unreal, movies with Fred Williams and Jim Brown, Jim Kelly, Richard Roundtree, uh, Yafit Kodo. Um, Gloria Hendry, a lot of, a lot of, I loved every minute of it, and that's what I learned. I really learned on those movies. So you have $3, then no money. Most of them I never got paid on, but I got experience. And the beauty of it was I, I got days to get into the Directors Guild of America. Now, it, was, it took me 11 years to get into it, because you need 600 days as a production assistant. <clears throat> and X amount have to be in a production office, X amount have to be on a film set, next to X amount have to be in post-production. In those days, there was no post-production. Everything went back to Hollywood. So I got in my car and I went to Hollywood. And I worked as an assistant film editor. And then I worked at MGM as an assistant. Uh, no, this is politically incorrect, but the title I had was Clap a Loda Boy. <laughs> that was my title, and that was a union title. And you'd go, you know, C41, and then you go back out with your heads of changing bags, download mags, you know, upload mags, and bring it. Before Panavision was even invented, you see the old Mitchell reflex cameras, if anyone wants to be a cinematographer with this. Um, anyway, you worked very hard a lot of years, and then many years later, I was uh, working in New York. For a guy I met early on, Fred Williamson, who was an old football player who was directing movies, and I worked as his assistant director, and had enough days to get into the union, and all of a sudden this movie came along called Trading Places. Now, I don't know if any of you guys remember that movie, but it was Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd and uh, Jamie Lee Curtis and Ralph Bellamy and Don Amici, and that took me from the independent world inside the studio walls. And that was probably the greatest thing that ever happened to me. And I didn't know then that someday I'd be running the studio that I'm now working for. That was the beauty of this business. And <clears throat> I just worked very hard. And I went from there to a lot of miniseries and TV series. And you know, in, in the 70s, they never made a home movie in New York. They used to come, shoot out on the streets, exploit New York, then go to Montreal or Hollywood to, um, to shoot all of the stage work. So we did Cagney and Lacey or Kojak and these shows. You know, and, and they were fun, but there was no money, but you needed your days to get into the union. That's the only way I knew how to get in, because I knew nobody in this world. My uncle was a very famous cinematographer, but I didn't want to be a cinematographer. So in those days, of course, when you start in this business, everybody wants to direct. That's kind of a cool thing to do, you know. Then you get along a little more. You direct one or two. I directed a couple of music videos in the early days, and I realized, you know, this is really hard work. I'm a lazy bastard. What am I going to do with all this shit? <laughs> so I said, I saw a producer sitting in a chair smoking cigars. That's the job I want. <laughs> and I, and I, fortunately, I was lucky. I kept going and trading places, doing mini series, NBC Rage Mail, the Jacqueline Smith stuff. Uh, and then I became an assistant director. And I did Cocktail with Tom Cruise and Rob Lowe, a couple of Rob Lowe movies, and then a whole bunch of. Um, uh, miniseries, TV shows, uh, and that was great. I loved it. And then one day I was uh, doing a Brooke Shields movie, and they fired the production manager. And uh, the head of CBS, John Backey, called me up and said, Listen, could you production manager me? I didn't even know what production manager did. I had an idea, but I didn't really know. I said, Sure. And I went and took the job, and, and it, worked out, it worked out well. And before the movie ended, they, hired the, they fired the producer. So the same guy called me, can you produce the rest of this movie? There's only four weeks left. Of course. Mm -hmm. And that was 1986. That was like my first producing credit. And I kind of never looked back. And, and uh, I would production manage, produce from that on, then on forward. Until 1989, I was producing a show in Boston with all these kids that nobody ever heard of. Matt Damon, Ben Affleck, Brendan Fraser, Chris O'Donnell, Anthony Rapp, 
uh, and more. It was called school time, but anti-Semitism in prep schools in the 1950s. You like that one? So, I mean, it was, it, was, it was fun, but these kids, they didn't, they were, Matt Damon didn't shave yet. <laughs> so, um, he tells a story, I'll tell you, so he came to me, he said, you know what, I'm loving this acting stuff, I'm quitting college. I said, where are you going to college? He said, Harvard. I said, you're quitting Harvard to act? You, you got to be dumb. And he looked at me, I'm going to tell you what I really said, I want to curse it, not much I've heard of But I said, Matt, I tell you what, if you don't go back to Harvard, I'm going to black boy you from the industry. And he said, you're serious? I said, I'm dead serious. I'll call every studio ahead and tell you you're not going to be. And he tells the story all the time. And he went back to Harvard. I don't think he ever graduated. But he did go back for two more years. And then he came out and he and Ben Affleck. School ties. Uh, school ties. Anyway, after school ties, Stanley Jaffe called me up and said, Mike, I want you to be Brandon Tartikoff. Is it Brandon Tartikoff? He's like the head of NBC, the biggest, biggest, most powerful guy in the business. And he said, you're going to like me. He's from Brooklyn like you. So I said, OK. So I, uh, I met with him. And he said, listen, I just became the chairman of the board of Paramount Pictures. I want you to run production for me. I said, shit, I don't know if I can do this. So I said, no. They called me back. And every time I said no, they offered me $25,000 a year more. $25,000 a year. Yes. So when it, now, this is 1991. Uh, not 1990. I'm starting a movie with Demi Moore and Robert Redford and Woody Harrelson called Indecent Proposal. Adrian Lyne is directing it. And I'm producing it with Sherry Lansing. Because she and I did school ties together. And I said, Sherry, they really they want me to come in. And, Sweetie, you got to do it. You have to do it. I said, OK. So I finished Indecent Proposal. I went in and I did three years there. And then Brandon Tartikoff, sadly, calls me up in his office one day and said, Mike, I just found out I have, uh, what's the cancer you die from first? Pancreatic cancer, and I have three months to live. I said, what? So he, we hugged, and he said goodbye, and he died a little while later. Greatest guy ever. I'm still getting emotional when I talk about him. Anyway, he, um, then we, we recommended Cherry Lansing, who was Stanley Javi's partner, and she and I did movies together. And she came in and did a magnificent job running Paramount Pictures. And we did a lot of movies from Forrest Gump to The Firm and uh, Hunt for Red October and Bobby Fish, a lot of great movies. And I just decided one day I can't take it anymore. I'm smoking at least three packs a day. I got a bottle of Jack Daniels on my desk. I mean, I said, shit, I'm going to die young. I don't want to die young, you know? So I, um, I went into Sher Sherry's office. Sherry, I have to leave. She said, please, stay a few more months, please. I stayed three more months, and then they found a replacement. I left. But just before I left, a, a director who I was, did the visual effects with on Hunt for Red October by the name of John McTiernan called me up and he said, Mike, I want you to produce my new movie. I'm doing Die Hard. He, produced, he directed Die Hard 1. He's directing Die Hard 3. He said, I really want you to do this. You're going to have a great time, and, and, and we're going we're gonna to laugh and have a lot of fun. And I said, OK. So, um, I left, and I was the only producer. I was a sole producer on Die Hard 3. They gave me enough money to, that I never dreamt of ever getting. And the percentage of the box office, the movie did, by the way, $700 million. So it was a sizable check. And, you know, Gulfstream, private planes, LA, back and forth. It was just it was a great experience. And also, I had met Samuel L. Jackson, and we became friendly um, years earlier. And on, um, because if you remember in Coming to America, the guy that holds up the McDowell's with the rifle, mm -hmm. that's Sam Jackson, it was one of his first roles. Mm -hmm. And um, I got him in the, the Die Hard to play uh, along with uh, Bruce Willis. Anyway, from, from there on in, it was just, you know, movie after movie after movie, and, and a lot of them are luck. The fact that I did Ghost was a great help also. As people said, what was your last few movies? Oh, I did Ghost and Training Places. Oh, shit, that's not so bad. So I don't mean to be like boasting, but I'm just trying to tell you it's, it was the quality of the movie that advanced you into the different list, the A-list or whatever you want to call it. Um, and uh, let's produce, I'm doing Sesame Street now. My last movie was Ocean's 8 with all the women. And the studio said, oh, you can't make this movie. I said, why? Movies the women don't make money. I said, how about the first wives club? Well, that's one. <laughs> I said, okay. 
So they let us make it. We didn't have a lot of money to do it, but you know, Sandy Bullock was fantastic, and I love Anne Hathaway, and I <laughs> fell in love with Rihanna, and uh, Kate Blanchett. It was just a wonderful group of women, and we made a wonderful movie, and we did, you know, three hundred fifty million dollars for not a big budget. So that was a good one. A couple before that, like Winter's Tale and One All Night, and you know, all those other movies didn't make that kind of money. But anyway, and that's my life up until today. I mean, I've left out a lot of movies on purpose, but. What did you say you did before assistant director? Uh, I was a production assistant, <coughs> which is the, your entrance level into this business. Um, and it's something, you, if you really want to be in a business, that's where you learn everything. Because you can be a PA with the camera department, the editorial, and the production office on the set for an actor. I mean, there's different ways. The worst part is working for an actor because you see all these perks. And then you get one of my assistants I gave to, to Sam Jackson, actually, my friend Leonard. And he left Leonard. Leonard left Sam Jackson to become an actor. I saw him in two TV things, and I never saw him again. He disappeared with face here. But you get spoiled by them. So I don't know what else to say about myself, other than uh, I loved every day of my life working, and, uh, and I would start again tomorrow. It's how much fun I had. Uh, I was wondering if you just touched on Hitch, because that's like, one of my favorite movies, like, probably of all time. Like, Hitch was probably, like, and Will Smith, just that interaction. Well, like Will that. Smith is, if you had to pick one actor in this world that's the easiest to work with, the nicest human being, the most generous human being, you would say it's Will Smith. If I could work every movie for the rest of my career with just Will Smith, I'd be the happiest guy in the world. <laughs> and we play golf together. He's a really good golfer also. Mm -hmm. um, but Hitch... Hitch had a different name. Um, it was called The Last First Kiss, was the name of the movie when we started it. And nobody could remember the name of the movie. So we, it wasn't called Hitch until just before we released it, because his name was Hitchinson yeah. in, in the movie. And um, Andy Tennant directed it. And uh, I don't know what the, more to say about it. It was just the script from day one was fantastic. Will brought it to life. Nobody but Will brought it to life. And um, Eva Mendez, who was in that? Yeah, Eva Mendez, I fell in love with. She was fantastic. And it was just, it was a really, it was another, that was just another fun job. Kevin, what's, this, what's the stock you guys named? Uh, Kevin? Kevin James. Kevin James, yeah, he was. He's Kevin Can Wait. <laughs> Kevin Can Wait is his show, but he, he was pretty terrific. We had a lot of fun. We all went to Hawaii together. We treated ourselves to, you know, we got on Wolf's plane, we went to Hawaii to play golf at the end. <laughs> it, it, you know, it's that kind of stuff that, that was, makes it so much fun. So you said you had a famous uncle cinematographer growing up. My uncle, nobody would know anything about the movies he did. He made movies like Seven Brides and Seven Brothers, Meet Me in St. Louis, The Balcony, Executive Suite, um, Fastest Gun in the West. He did all of these movies. He was 14-time Academy Award nominated cinematographer. And when I was very young, I mean, a teenager. I went to California and worked for him. And I said, this is too odd. It was just too odd. He was shooting in 1968. I was like 17 years old, and he was shooting uh, Here's Peggy Fleming right after she won the um, Olympic gold, gold medal for ice skating. And he took the refrigerated stage on the old back lot, which doesn't exist anymore, which was MGM, is now Sony. And he built an ice rink and painted it black, and had Gene Kelly and Peggy, Peggy uh, O'Neill, Peggy Fleming, um, dancing on ice. And it was just the most beautiful show you ever, you could still probably get it somewhere. It was called Here's Peggy Fleming. And it was my first introduction to rock and roll people. We had, it was supposed to be on the show, it was supposed to be the Jefferson Airplane. You probably don't know who that is either. but. Days were starting to shoot. They don't show up. There was there were coke, not coke out, drugged out somewhere, and they couldn't move. So I realized, okay, now I understand this whole. I don't want to be in that world. I want to be in this world. Now I've gotten two gold, two platinum and one gold albums for producing records for the movies, like Boys the Men and UB40. But. Um, 
that's for a movie, not for what these other guys do in producing albums. I would, could never do that. I would never want to do that. And, and it's crazy. But back to Hitch. We laughed every day in that movie. Every day. With the dancing, with Kevin James, you know. <coughs> and that's my whole life. And I'm still doing it. Uh, what were the main differences you probably saw between like working on TV shows and then working on movies? If you look at it this way, if you shoot the amount of pages in a script in a day, on a, t on a feature film we do pro approximately maybe two and a half pages a day. So that's two and a half, you figure a minute a page. So that's two and a half pages a day. On a TV show, my director who's doing Baskets now in Portlandia said he just shot nine pages the day before. So there's your, there's your easy way for me to explain the difference. I lived in Portland, so that show is pretty Oh, you noticed? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great show. Yeah, yeah. It's actually hilarious. It's, it's perfect. So what, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, do writers come to you with stories? Like, what is the best way to have a story heard or your idea heard as a screenwriter? I have offices at Warner Brothers in, in Los Angeles in Burbank, and I have offices at California Story Studios in Queens. And we have a story department, so stuff is submitted. It's got it. We don't accept any. It doesn't go through a lawyer or an agent, because on coming to America, we all got sued by Ock Buckwald, and that wasn't fun. So to submit a story to your office, you need to be represented by. Yeah, you need represent. You need representation. Yeah, we don't take cold scripts because. What's that? My script. Cameron stole his story. You had to say that? I <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes, yes. Yes, Paramount stole a book whole story. It was coming to America. It was a different name. It was a, the Prince of New York, it was called when, when he wrote it. Right. They're, they're remaking it. I, I heard, yeah, I don't care. Everything gets remade. Yep. What would you consider is the most difficult obstacle to overcome to get to where you are now? Do you have to work where? What would you consider the most difficult obstacle you've had to overcome to get to the position that you're in now? Well, there's a lot of them. It wasn't, it wasn't, you know, so many of them. Um, when you're young, they're easy. You can't do it when you're old. That's, that's the problem. I couldn't start today. At your age, what's an obstacle? You know, so you get a rejection. You've got to learn rejection. Not like an actor, but still got to learn, learn rejection. I, uh, I was told on a job that... Um, we wanted somebody shorter. I said, why? I said, well, because you know, in front of the camera, we wanted people to be able to walk around and not have their head in the back of the camera. That's the one reason I didn't get one job. Um, but there's no, there's no obstacle you can't overcome at your age. You just have to believe in yourself. And uh, if you do, it's, there's, there's no better business in the world. TV's harder than, than, than films, though, I will say that. Because of the schedule? Yeah, yeah. Is there something that like surprised you with the industry that you like never thought like was a thing? Or Today it's, I'm surprised because okay. it all became corporate. I won't tell the name of the studio. I'll tell you a quick story. We're filming Coming to America and we're up in uh, Harlem. And every time the director said, roll, some kid put on a boom box. So cut, cut, cut. We can't film. So I went over to the kid and said, listen, please. He said, well, give me some money. So I gave him 100 bucks. He said, 100 bucks? I gave him 200. He said, OK. <laughs> so he took the 200 bucks. <clears throat> and then, then you have petty cash. So I sent the petty cash in, and they rejected it. I said, why did you reject it? Well, the corporate world, it doesn't work that way. And I'm speaking to the, the head of the CPA for the company, the big public health company. It was Paramount Pictures. I'll tell you who it was. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> He said, well, in the future, you have to come to the office, make a, get a check requisition, get the check. We're not saying not to pay them. Go and cash it and then take it back. Let me understand this. I'm spending $18,000 an hour to make this movie. You want me to shut production down, go here, go there, go back like four hours, so I should just piss away $80,000 and drop a day's worth of shooting. So he said, well, that's the rules. I said, what films have you done? Where, what is your background? He said, well, the truth is, um, 
I was never, never did a film. I said, what is your background? He said, well, I was the head CPA for Haynes Pantyhose. I looked at this guy and said, what? He said, yeah, I work for Haynes Pantyhose. So I said, what gives you the right to be telling me how to make a movie? He says, well, it's the corporate rules. And I said, how'd you get the job? He said, well, at the time, Gulf and Western Industries was bought out by Paramount Communications, which bought all Waterford Crystal and all these different companies. One of them happened to be Haynes Pantyhose. So, hey, right, you're an accountant here, you go over here. So there's the answer to that. I know this wasn't the point of the story, but if that kid was smart, he would have told all his friends to bring their boom boxes and they could all have made 200 bucks. <laughs> you know, you're right. But we've had a lot of things like that on movie sets. I had a kid come over to me and he said, some guy came out of, out of the crowd with a gun to shoot Eddie Murphy. I wrestled him to the ground and uh, give me a thousand dollars. I said, where's the gun? I threw it down the sewer. So I said, well, tell it to the police officer. If he agrees with you, I'll give you money. But you get shit like that all the time. Some good, that's good for, we used to write it into, into uh, TV shows like Kojak. That's a good idea. Put it in the script. Mm -hmm. Something else? Just the uh, organization uh, except uh, patented uh, stories. Say that one more time. Is it like the organization like Warner Brothers, Warner Brothers or like someone else except patents and uh, stories? Sure. Sure. Just, you know, everything's having submitted through the right way, though. Can't just, nobody's going nobody's to get anything cold. Broadway they will, but not, not in uh, theater they will. We think about this like huge increase in like Netflix movies being made, and, like those kind of movies, like Hulu, like these different online sites, basically having full budgeted movies. Um, I may go to work for them one of these days, so I really don't want to say anything. Like this. <laughs> Actually, yeah. But but yes, I mean you know, they, uh, let me try it this way. You have a company that has subscribers, 150 million subscribers. And some pay 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 bucks a month, whatever it may be for Netflix. Let's say an average of $10 million, $10,000 a month. So with the, times 150 million, what is 10? You're the professor. What's $10 times 150? <laughs> but you're smart. I want the what I need. Yeah. <laughs> so 150 million times, so it's uh, $1.5 billion. $1.5 billion. Now, if you have that coming in every month into your company for doing nothing, you can pay people whatever they want. You can exploit the world. You can do anything you want to do. I mean, I know you're probably talking about what Steven Spielberg was upset about. You know, why can they be nominated for Academy Award? They, not, they have to play in a theater. I agree with them. I agree with them. That's right. That's right. Hundred percent right. <laughs> So as a producer, you would you're, you're the type of person on the set who has to acquire things or behind the scenes who has to get people and get things for the production to happen, right? So what would you say is the hardest thing to get every single time you make a movie? It's easy, money. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, money, it's, you know, I'm doing a show now where every day they want to cut back on the funds, you know. I don't blame them because they have some kind of reward risk ratio where they see what is a movie worth, what is it worth of pre-sales in Europe. If they go to Mifet or Cannes and they pre-sell a movie, sure, if you have Will Smith, you can get any amount of money you want. If we're starring in it, you ain't gonna get $10. You know, so, so the money is, is, the is the toughest thing. The rest of it, it comes fine. You get the right casting director, the right cinematographer, the right, the right other crew people. If, they, if they're all professional and do their job, you make a good, good, a good product. Where do you get your money from? Studios. Studios. Yeah. I'm behind the studio. Well, I've been a, a term deal at Warner Brothers for the last 22 years. Um, before that, I haven't, I've never been independent since 1986. I've always gone, it was either networks or studios. I'm, that, that's why I feel I'm the most blessed guy in the world. Everybody else is forming limited partnerships, raising $10,000 on their uncle, $25,000 this one, to make their movie. Mine is they get a script, they like it, I then link it to, to uh, an actor, and, and I take it in, and, and they say, oh, well, he's worth so much, and the script is good, so this is how much we're going to give you. 
kind of related to that, as somebody who spent pretty much his entire career within the studio system, yeah. do you have the same complaints that other people have that this, this system has shifted towards bigger tentpole movies, franchises, kids' movies? Do you have the same issues with that? Or no. It is what it is. I, it just is what it, it is what it is. What I have issues with is how it's gone so corporate. Mm -hmm. Where it used to be all filmmakers and all people who understood what you did for a living. Now it's like, you know, all the way right. Is that a left, credit right, and what's your bottom line? That's all they seem to be a kid about these days. Because they hear that, I'm probably going to give the job, by the way. Question back. Yeah, what's the skill set that makes you good as a producer and others that you find are uh, successful in your field that separates them? Why would a studio invest in you? I'd love to say personality, but there's some real pricks out there that make a fortune of money and make great movies. And when that goes off, I'll give you names. <laughs> but I do think it's your track record because there's a great element of luck also. In other words, we can be just as good quality as producers. Yet, at an early age, I was able to do a movie like Ghost. I was like, wow, you made Ghost? Whoa, okay. Put him on this one. You know, the studios start chasing you at that point. So, I mean, it's really, and that was all luck. <laughs> when we started Ghost, Somebody looked at me and they said, you know, like, how do you guys name Bob Relier, who's the head of production at Paramount. I said, Mike, you got to do me a favor. This movie with this guy, Patrick Swayze, who did this Dirty Dancing movie. Then he did a movie called Roadhouse and Next to Kin. Both went in the toilet. And I have uh, this, this gal who's only been successful, Demi or Demi or something like that. She's only been successful in Rob Lowe movies. And then I have this Jewish comedian named Whoopi Goldberg. I don't know what the hell she does. I said, by the way, she's not Jewish. <laughs> and, of course, the movie did a billion dollars. So when you do one like that, all of a sudden they start chasing you. You don't have to chase them too hard anymore. That's the lucky part of it. Has there ever been a film that you wanted to make, or that you were passionate about making, but that you weren't able to make? Some, Some like it hot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Try it for 30 years. The remake, Wait. not the original. The remake, yeah. They won't let me. I've tried for 30 years. They wouldn't let you because they had the script? No, not the script no they, they, certain movies they call frozen movies. I'll give you an example. I, I tried to do uh, a remake of a movie called One Touch of Venus with Ava Gardner and Robert Walker. Oh, I love that film. Yeah, where he was walking down the street and he's by, by a department store and he yeah. saw a mannequin in the window and he yeah. fell in love with her. And then one day he ran through the whole department store, they took her out of the window, and he finds her in the lingerie section, he kisses her, she turns into life, turns into Ava Garner. Right, right, right. Well, I tried to remake that after Rage of Angels, a TV series, a TV miniseries doing with Jacqueline Smith. And at the time, I was very friendly with John Belushi. So I said, you could be the guy that kisses us, he's in the window, and we're going to make it. Well, they said, no, the movie's frozen, you can't make it. Uh -huh. It was owned by Universal Pictures, they can't make it. And then... Two years later, I made mean, a movie called Mannequin, which is almost the same damn movie. I'm a little pissed off, but there's nothing I can do about it. But, but they said that Some Up Hot is a frozen movie, it's a classic, you can't, they can't make that, you can't make Casablanca, there's certain movies you can never make, again. Do you have an idea for the remake that you were- Hell yeah. yeah okay. I, I was casting. Do you want to share it with us? Well, in those days, I, I was, you know who Arsenio Hall is? You guys know me? Arsenio and I, we wanted to make it together. And it was right after coming to America, and we tried to sell it. And we wanted Eddie Murphy to star and play Tony Curtis, and he was going to play Jack Lemmon, Arsenio. And we had Whitney Houston to play Marilyn Monroe. Wow. And um, we had Sylvester Sloan to play George Rathbart. The, you know. <laughs> and we thought it would be such a cool idea, and nobody liked the idea. Seems like a no-brainer. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So you never know. Mm -hmm. um, you said that you moved to Hollywood because that's where everything went on. Do you think that's still like true today? No. You could, there's a lot of entertainment in New York. It depends on what area you want to go into. If you want to go into becoming like a creative executive and, and do scripts and rewrite, you know, that sort of world, that's probably Hollywood. If you want to just be a, a filmmaker, you're going to have to get out there for a period of time and visit studios and get people to know who you are. But then you could live in Des Moines. Doesn't matter. You think it's just on what she said, you think it's better to get started in LA than it would be to New York? 
Well, I, I liked being in New York because you learned the streets and it was like kind of down a dirty way of making, of making movies. It wasn't behind, you know, in these big beautiful sound stages and you know, you're on a street corner with people screaming at you, you know. I always found this in New York and Los Angeles was, if you're filming on a street corner and somebody comes walking along, excuse me sir, do you mind walking in the other seat? Fuck you, I'm going to my job. <laughs> you go to LA, um, she was like, oh yeah, who was in it? Who's directing it? Who wrote it? Who, <laughs> oh, I want, you know, that's the difference I've always found on the two coasts. In LA, they're really into it. Here, they just, you know, their jobs more important. But I, I think New York's a great training ground, an answer to that. Well, I'm from San Diego, California, so I'm moving to LA next year, so. Yeah. Moving to LA? Yeah, yeah. I love LA, by the way. Yeah, I know, it's good. It's Been there forever. <laughs> I used to love Staten Island, so what do you say? <laughs> particular favorite genre that you like to stick with? You know, that's, that's a really good question because I used to think I love big action movies, Die Hards and Hunt for Red Octobers and movies like that. Then I used to love like comedies like Hitch and Coming to America and Trading Places. And now I don't really have one anymore. I just, if it's, if it's a good script, man, I'm doing Sesame Street. <laughs> you know? I mean, uh, that's, I don't know if it's a great idea or a terrible idea, but I'll let you know in a year. But, um, what about the Avenger films? Which one? The Avenger films. The superhero films, actually? They're, they're, like I love them. I love to watch them. You know? and, and if you're a producer on them, you're automatically a very wealthy person. <laughs> <laughs> My friend makes most of those, and he, he's made a, a bloody fortune. But I would do one if it was offered to me. You know, I always wondered as you get up in age, you know. You get into your 60s, they don't offer you the movies, they offer you in your 40s. So, we'll see what happens. Uh, what is the uh, best part of the job and what's the worst part? Well, the, the, there's two best parts. One is the, being a, in a preview and seeing an audience cheering and screaming and loving the project you did. And the second part is the amount of money they give you to do it. <laughs> I'm not sure which is better. Right now, I'd rather be in the theater listening to people loving it and applauding it and being wonderful. Years ago, you know, my first wife became very wealthy because of all of, all of that. You know? <laughs> but um, it's, it's I, like I said before, I love every day. It's not, I mean, I had aggravation today and Sean Bell over here, the guy that runs our show, he'll tell you. I had aggravation today, you would not believe. I got in the car to come here and started laughing about it. Well, what's the worst they could do to me? Fire me? Okay, I'll start another project. But that, that won't happen. Anyway. And what's the worst part? <clears throat> Bad reviews. Putting your life into a movie like Winter's Tale, which I loved every minute of it, and then it didn't do any business. And then having to listen to Russell Crowe or Colin Farrell say, Mike, but it's a great movie. What happened? I like that. It's almost like your fault. Um, and it, was, and it was a wonderful movie with a brilliant man by the name Kiva Goldsman, one of the great writers and directors of all time, and just didn't work. Did you ever have like a time where you just felt like, this is not going right, I don't know what to do? Like, and what not a time, like, many times. <laughs> many times. Um, what else could I do? What am I to go sell sneakers or something? I don't know what the hell. Well, <laughs> what am I qualified to do in life, you know? When you, and, 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 and film is a heroin. When you get bitten by the bug, it's real hard to go in another direction. Um, it's very addictive and very wonderful. So we were talking earlier about paying the kid who had the radio with money that you really shouldn't have committed right. at the moment. Are there any other times that you pushed the boundary so far that maybe it could have cost you your job? Oh, probably quite a few times. Um, you know, with, with directors, once we scout a location, wants to shoot here. We get there in a day, oh no, I want to shoot here. And I just have to go like, pay a ton of money to everybody to make it work, because you paid for this side of the street. They're not going to give you a refund, because you're not filming this. So you got to give them the same amount of money on this side of the street, and you don't know if you're getting it back. So that's, that's a little bothersome, you know. Um, Right now, to get, I get it back, though. 
I, by some way I will get it back, you know. But um, other than that, not really. I just, uh, it's a great business. I wish you all would just go into it. You know, I root for everybody in every movie to be successful. Most people, well, you know, they always criticize their competitor. But stay positive about everything. The more people that go, the more money everybody makes. But what I say? Um, we were spending the production of the film uh, Cleopatra, which was which one? Cleopatra. Cleopatra. We were studying this in France about well, because they had like many, many production issues. And the problem was not like it was a bad movie. There was like many things that happened. Some of them like were inevitable. And I was going to ask you if you know like some do's and don'ts that you can like avoid, like don't do this or do that, like to avoid like these big productions to don't sink. Well, fortunately that one never sank. And and by the way, you know, the whole budget with all the problems is about ten million dollars. Which today you can't do a TV show for. Um, but Yes, you have to be pre-prepared. That's what preparation of a movie is. You think well, everything can go wrong at a location and cover yourself before you get there. And, and in those days, they never even thought of doing that. Especially if you had Elizabeth Taylor or Richard Burton or something. I mean, it was, you know. The, the shirts, when they, went, when, when they arrived in Europe, and then like the weather in London wasn't the same weather, and then they have to move to Italy, and then in Italy they have like, tons of problems like, with the pulp and the skirts. That's right, so that's like, right. A lot of they had a wind problem on that show, you know. Yeah, like every kind, of, every kind of production problem you could have, they had them at movies. So. Yeah, no, it, it, that happens. The worst thing if somebody dies on a movie set. <coughs> like on Brain, oh, was that one Natalie Wood when she died? Brainstorm was it? No, Brainstorm. Brainstorm. Yeah. Not moral. Well, no, Natalie Wood when she died on uh, Brainstorm. They had to finish the movie without her in it. River Phoenix, too. Well, River Phoenix, I, we were doing a movie called The Thing Called Love with Samantha Mathis and River Phoenix and uh, Dermot Mulroney and I think it was Sandra Bullock's first, <coughs> first or second part. And I, I was with my cousin George. We were walking by the, the, uh, the urinal in the men's room and River Phoenix was like going like this. And all of a sudden he fell backwards and this guy caught him and he was peeing as he's falling backwards. I mean, he was so out of it. Um, I went to Peter Bogdanovich, who was his director. I said, Peter, River's pretty messed up. No, 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 he's fine, he's fine, he's fine. But then he was very concerned about him, and, um, and it was about six or eight, maybe a year later, he did, he did wind up dying outside the Viper room that day. But yeah, he was a good example. What are some films that you saw before you got in? The film industry that made you want to get involved, and you can't say so like it, something like that. Well, that was one of them, okay. and and Casablanca was one of them. Um, I loved Casablanca, and uh, and then well, you know what? You're not, not going to like this at all. I used to like the Doris Day Rock Hudson movies. Love them. They're great. <laughs> I I thought they were just fun and easy, and I said, "Geez, what a great way to make a living, hanging out with these people," and you know. But there, there were so, so many, I mean, you know, I'm not going to say, oh, Potemkin and all of these heavy movies, you know. I mean, I had to study Potemkin in film school, but no, it wasn't, if I had to deal with Potemkin, I would not be in the business. So a lot of other fun movies. Did that hurt? That's how it feels about Potemkin. That's how I felt about Potemkin. Yes, Paula. What the day-to-day -day life of a producer on a film set is like? Some days I do nothing. Well, that's what we want to hear. Yes. Like, what, 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 what Some you, days my well, biggest concern like, is they ran out of sesame bagels. What kind of crap is this? You know, that's what my big concern for some days. <laughs> <clears throat> Other, you know, if, if things go smooth on a movie set, if you've all professionals, there's not a lot to do. I go, I watch dailies, I see what we shot the day before, make sure we got everything we needed. If we don't have everything we need, I go back to the director. I said, by the way, you need another close-up, you need a two-shot, you need over the shoulder, you need a complimentary, whatever it might be. <clears throat> but most of the time, um, I just look pretty. <laughs> so a lot of work is beforehand. <laughs> most of my work is, 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 is a pre-production movie. That's how I work really hard. Get everything in order and make sure that the, from the script to the locations to the cast to the crew, everybody, that everything's in order and we can go. And how involved are you in post-production? 
Well, not like I used to be. I go a couple of months and then I just look, show up for the previews. I used to be very involved in post-production. What changed when we do stop uh, I became too ADD, I think. <laughs> Can't sit in a dark room, an eight by 10 dark room with no windows and just looking at a monitor all day. I just couldn't do it. How long is usually pre-production? Minimum of 12 weeks. Sesame Street, because there's so much difficulty in, in building and like for instance, and you're not going to learn a film school if you're shooting Big Bird and he goes outside, does his feathers fly off? What film school is going to teach you that one? <laughs> but um, there's a lot of testing you have to do with these puppets outside in the streets. So we're on this one, what is this, 16 weeks? Is this, is this movie is 16 weeks. 10 to 12, sometimes 14, is a good preparation time on a feature film. We usually do TVs, TV, it was like, you know, 10 days prep and 22 days shoot and that's it. But no, I'm too tired for that. I think I might know the answer to this, but what was it you didn't like about being a production executive as opposed to being a producer on your own? Working for the studio. What do you think oh, the answer, what, what did you think the answer was? Too corporate. <laughs> man, oh man, it was so corporate and, and all these guys that, you know, all boards, as we know, different, different people, like on a college board, right? <laughs> the board of Wagner College. I'm sure everyone are professors that sit on that board. There may be a doctor, there may be a lawyer, but everybody <laughs> tells you how to run the school. It's the same in the, on a film board. You sit in the corporate world, you go into the boardroom, and, you know, this guy, this guy is like in head of a, a bank, this guy, you know, and they're telling you how to make a movie. I got crazy with that. I just couldn't deal with it anymore. And I had to get out. Yet I would do it again today. Because I'm older and I think differently. Mm. <coughs> You'd better, you be better able to handle mm -hmm. stuff you didn't like now? Yeah, okay. yeah. You have other projects lined up? What do you see yourself doing in the next five, ten years? I want to do one movie a year for another ten years and then maybe just step down. Um, I don't really want to. Retire. I don't really want to retire. My mentor was a guy named Howard Koch. I don't know if you ever met Manchurian Candidate. A couple of great movies, and he told me you never retire from the entertainment business. The entertainment business retires from you. Mm -hmm. They send you out to pasture, and I said I don't believe it. I don't believe it, but I'm sure it's going to happen. And then, you know, my, my dream was to drop that on a movie set. You know, leave a movie set feet first. You know, <laughs> of course, be old then, but. I would, I would say by the, by the time you're 75 or so, 78, <coughs> many, you know, many of the kids that are running studios, they don't know who you are. They're, they don't know many of your movies. No matter how big or how, how iconic I may think they are, or how much money they've made. Look, I, I was, what we were just talking about, when I, when, I, when I told you about, I was talking to one of the kids about John Lennon, and I said, who the hell is John Lennon? Okay. <coughs> I mean, that scared me a little. So, yeah, I'm going to keep working. I, I'm, I may do a movie, there's a movie called The Brotherhoods, which is kind of like a gangster squad movie, which I love doing, the Ryan Gosling movie I did. I'd like to do another one like that, maybe next year. I just have to finish this one. For, I'm going to miss till the end of the year, so I have to figure this one out first. Some scenes that you like to wish you fix or done better on? That's a, that's a really good question. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, you can look at something a thousand times and never see the flaws in it because you realize what went through to make it. And then when you go to a theater and there's like, you know, 150, 200 people around you and they have a different opinion than you, you say, oh shit, you know, I'm not right. So yes, that happens quite a bit, by the way. But hopefully it's not in a major way. It's usually minor stuff. And then there's a lot of mistakes. Like there's a, there's a website that takes mistakes in movies. The number one, one of the biggest mistakes they have is when 
Bruce Willis and Sam Jackson are speeding in Die Hard 3 and they hit and they hit, they crash into a tree and they roll over and they're shot and there's blood and, and when Bruce gets out of the, 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 uh, the limo, climbs out and it's raining and it's terrible and he has beautiful white, <coughs> beautiful white socks on. You know, the scene before was all muddy and dirty. Was, you know. So there's, there's a lot of mistakes we make. Especially geographic mistakes. Many movies make them. You're walking down Broadway, and next 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 tent, you're on Wall Street. You know, you make a left on a corner on 58th Street. Next thing you're walking down Wall Street. <coughs> that happens all the time. Yeah. So yes, there's a lot of that. I have a, a favorite with that one. I think it's called um, Music and Lyrics. With, yeah. Uh, and they have the scene uh, where they're having a muffin and and, and a, a t iced tea. And every time they <coughs> the, uh, you know back back and forth, uh, the muffin has a bite. Now it doesn't have a bite. Oh yeah. So you drank this much. Now you have a full glass. <laughs> it's, it's hilarious because it keeps changing every shot. <laughs> I, I you know I see that a lot actually. I once did a TV show as an assistant director, and, and an assistant director, you and a script supervisor are supposed to be like partners in continuity, make sure everything works. And we were filming, it was Jacqueline Smith <coughs> in, in a courtroom, and three of the jurors who worked on Monday didn't show up on Tuesday. So I said, well, I can't stop the production. So I took put three extras to sit here, here, and here, and just... And Nobody to this day ever noticed that it was different people. It was the same jury, but they didn't even notice them, you know. So we do that a lot. I would if notice. you watch it, th that's it. Like the first time you watch it, you, you may not notice. But we tend to repeat. That's, that's how you notice. Films, and then you catch on. That's how you notice, notice. exactly. <laughs> exactly. Somewhat related to that, you're a big believer in the test screening process. Sure, I do three on every movie. Three, okay. Yeah. What, what's the most significant changes you've made as a result of the preview screening? The endings of movies. Um, a lot of the endings are... Uh, I'm trying to remember the last big ending that we changed. Oh, on um, Ocean's 8. We did how many endings? Three. Three? Yeah. <laughs> Shot three separate endings. New York, L.A., back in the here. <laughs> and um, I'm not sure the right one is in there. What were the three Oh, I don't even remember. <laughs> um, they were all similar, but 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 different. Do you remember the show? There was one where uh, Clooney. It's implied that he maybe comes back. Oh yes, yes. When she goes in there, and 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 she she looks at him and it has his name, you know, Danny Ocean, and she says, you know, you may, you better be in there, you son of a bitch. And then all of a sudden, he hear the, the crypto <laughs> fade to black, you know. So. That's the one I wanted to do. This studio wouldn't let me. Oh, I don't even remember how it ended, though. That sounded good to me. I'm like, it doesn't end like that? No, she goes back in there, and she makes a martini and drinks it, and then they, oh, they cut. Okay. They tried to make it so it's a, a sequel could work. Yeah. But I thought with the ending, you could bring Clooney back in, in Ocean's Nine, and you need a Spanish person in it because the only thing you didn't have in the other one, you had every other nationality in it other than a Spanish person. Mm -hmm. And I said, bring Jennifer Lopez and George Clooney, let's do number nine. Who knows? Um, do you think it's harder to break into like the TV industry or the film industry? In, in what, what respect? In what job? Just to like, get more opportunities and like, kind of like What do you want to do? I want to work in film. Yeah, as, as? I want to be a producer. Oh, stealing my job. What is this? <laughs> <laughs> um, then I would stay in New York and come work as a production assistant. Matter of fact, talk to Charbel. You want to put you on Ocean's, Ocean, what are we doing now? Right. Sesame Street. <laughs> put you on Sesame Street. If you got, <laughs> if anybody wants an intern to come and see what's going on, we start July 22nd shooting. You're all more, all more than welcome. <laughs> you just made their summers. Yeah. <laughs> so you're, you're back in LA then, huh? I'll be here. Yeah, I'll be here. Okay. I'll be here. Whoever wants to come, sure. Um, what, what other advice would you give, like, 
to all the students looking for like production assistant jobs and etc. You have to, that you have to pound a payment for, or, or you know, call a guy like Charbel, he hires like 20 on every movie. Um, but you have to go, there's something called the techies list at, at the mayor's office for theater, film, and broadcast, I think it's called. Is they that changed what? the name to like mayor's office. office. What is it called now? I forget. It's still the mayor's office or something. Film and television broadcasting. Whatever you call it. And they have a list, and they have all the production managers and, and all of the different productions going on. And they're always looking for production assistants because they always grow and leave. And that, by the way, it's the only way to get into the film world. And it doesn't matter if it's TV or, or, or film. It's the same job on both, except TV, it's a lot harder, a lot, of less, lot less people, and a lot more hours. You said that job is sometimes <coughs> assisting an actor, right? So would that also be people that assist writers in the writing team, stuff like that? that, that Most writers team? don't have assistants. Okay. In TV, they do <laughs> The TV, board, the, the TV they do, yeah. yeah. But I, I don't. That's not my world. Yeah. At least since 1986 or seven, it hasn't been. Sure. Sure. Um, what's one piece of advice you would give a film student that's aspiring to do what you do? To be a producer. <laughs> just work on every show you can work on. Just become a production assistant and work hard, and never complain, and keep reading scripts. And when you find something you're really passionate about, the problem is. When you're first getting into it, you, you, uh, I, I'm most guilty of this. You read a script, oh, this is, this is it. This is my Gone with the Wind. I'm going to make this. And really shitty. It's a lousy <laughs> script. But because it's like yours, a friend of yours wrote it and gave it to you, you kind of kid yourself a bit. But you can, you can work. You can work as a production assistant. And it's a lot of hours. And, and um, What do they pay you? Professor? Minimum wage. What is that? Fifteen dollars an hour you get, but you usually get. Are we get a twelve-hour guarantee? Yes. You usually get a twelve-hour guarantee. How much does that come out to? It's like a thousand dollars a week. It's like a thousand bucks a week. It's but what you're doing is you're training. Yeah. It's like you're getting paid to go to school. Because nobody's nobody's ever asked asked me since 1973. Did you go to Ryan College? Did you go to college? Nobody's ever asked me the question. I've gotten an honorary PhD. I've, been, I've gotten medals, honors, keys to eight cities. I've the Governor's Appreciation Nevada Award, the Florida, some award. I got all these awards and placards hanging on my wall. But not one person ever asked, I went to grammar school. You know, I just tell them, I'm a Dr. Tadro, so I got a PhD. <laughs> as honorary as it might sound. But no, you got to just keep hustling and working as a production assistant, and you'll meet people. And the beauty of it is, and I, I tell this predominantly to very rich, rich kids. There's a, there's a kid who's got worth about $300 million. I think he's 20 years old. His father left him all this money. Well, I'm going to make my own movies. I said, well, you could, but you ought to learn how to do it before you make it. And he doesn't understand why. And, and, and I explained to him why, and which makes sense. I mean, it's only common sense. So I had him working as a production assistant. Oh, rain this day, it's too cold, I can't come to work. I mean, if you don't really want it, you're not going to get there. I really wanted it. And, and if you're going to school for film, you must really want it. Because you're going to find a lot of very rich kids that never went to college or out there on the street corners hustling. But the best way to do it is work as a production assistant, and you learn every department. If you want to work in, even in the editing department, you, you know, even in, um, you know, in the camera department, I, a kid comes and says, I want to be a cinematographer. We put him as a production assistant with the camera department. Let him learn the lenses, let him learn the filters, let him learn how it works. Um, <laughs> I want to be a producer. We put him in a group with us, you know, and to see what little we do. Only at Wagner College. Put on three productions here. One was The Boyfriend, and I don't remember the other ones. But, uh, <laughs> but I loved it. And by the way, last night I saw the new Tootsie. Uh, I don't highly recommend it, but it was OK. You'll enjoy it. But the night before, I saw The Temptations, which is one of, it was like the Jersey Boys, one of the best Broadway productions I've ever seen. So I highly recommend that one. 
And the beautiful thing about Wagner is you're a ferry boat away from going to Broadway. It's the best in the world, you know. If you're in LA, what are you gonna do? Go to Pantages Theater, see a B -p production, you know? Here you got it all right here, it's so wonderful. But no, I, I don't, not a lot to do with theater. I gotta ask you, uh, what's like one of your best golf stories with people you think about? It? <laughs> it sounds like you probably play a lot of golf, but it's probably like the one that, I, I know a lot goes on. Outside. I belong to a golf club called Bel Air Country Club in California. The 10th hole is 195 yards over ravine on elevated green. If you play golf, you understand this. I get up there with a the five wood, I hit the high shot, it bounces twice, goes in for a hole in one. I've never had a hole in one, I've never even hit the green before. <laughs> I turn around and there's a guy applauding. And I look at him and it's Dean Martin. <laughs> so I made him sign my scorecard to this <laughs> I said, when I, I go back to Brooklyn, nobody's going to believe Dean Martin saw me at a hole. You know, <laughs> that was my most fun ever in golf. That's fun. That's but, but if you want to have fun, you play golf with Will Smith. Yeah, it sounds like but, I would love to. You, <laughs> you just laugh He's and laugh time. and laugh and laugh, and, he, and nobody better in the world. He's the greatest guy on a front of the camera, behind the camera, whatever Will Smith is, nobody better. Other questions? What was the uh, story you were going to share with us before with uh, Ben Affleck and uh, Matt Damon off camera? I can't. <laughs> 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 no, they were, they were just, they were wonderful. They were young. They were ambitious. They were so smart. And they were writing scripts. And they were doing so much. They were terrific. It depends. You want the days to qualify to get into the Directors Guild so you can become an assistant director or a production manager. And that's the easiest step in the producing. So it's got to be on a qualified project. <coughs> um, what, are the, what are the ones we're thinking of when you, when you're saying that? Um, what, what are you, um, like you're saying what kind of show you're, you're talking about? Or what other kind of internships were you thinking of? Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess just, like, for example, I want to be very hands-on with a cinematographer, kind of like an editor. Um, and I was thinking, like, oh, like, production assistant, when you were saying, like, well, if they want to be a cinematographer, maybe they put them with, like, this group of people. Like, are there specific internships that would lead you more in specific directions for that kind of thing? Well, just yet. Yeah. just... At your age, it's probably hard to really to decide what you really want to do, what aspect of the business you want to be in. You know, somebody wants to be an actor, somebody wants to be a cinematographer, an editor, a producer, a director, costume designer, whatever it might be. Um, you have to kind of learn as a production assistant and watch what everybody does on a movie set. And then you'll really say, geez, I really like what he does. You know, when I was at MGM as a, as a kid, and I was on a set and I was changing my camera department, changing, downloading magazines, uploading magazines. It was about 120 degrees and I was hot and I was sweaty. And I went on the set and there was a guy yelling, hold the noise, quiet, settle down. I said, who is that guy? He said, that's the assistant director. I went, oh, how much does he make a week? It's $750. What? I'm working 73 hours a week for $112.50. I said, are you kidding me? That's the job I want. How do you get it? And somebody told me, I'll do a PA for 600 days on the street corners. And, and that's what I went after. I came back to New York and became a PA. And it's easier today. Because when I did it, it was, they shot 10 days exploiting the exteriors in New York and then went to Canada to shoot the interiors and sound stages or back to Hollywood. Today they shoot a movie from the beginning to the end, all in New York City. So... There's, there's a, I would, I wouldn't, if, if you want cinematography, I would just work one job to see what everybody does as a production assistant. Doing crowd control, that's all. And then the next job you learn, and the people you meet are the ones going to put you on the next one. And if you're good and you work hard, they're always going to be calling you for work. It's the PAs that disappear that they don't call. There's a lot of them. Or complain. Complain is not good. Pastor over here. Yeah. What is the craziest thing that's ever happened to you on the set, or on the set in general? There's been a lot of crazy things happening. <laughs> <laughs> I don't 
there's the craziest thing I can't tell you. <laughs> it didn't happen to me, but it happened. It, it was, it's about it's a sexual thing, and it had, I, I was not me sexually. There was <laughs> two other people that I happened to I had to go to the bathroom really bad, and and it was lunchtime, and I walked into this motorhome, and it was a sight I don't want to repeat. So, I mean, it's so bad I still see it in my mind. You know? <laughs> but yes. I wonder, was wondering if you could talk about what it's like working on Sesame Street, because obviously it's been running so long. I would imagine it's a pretty well-oiled machine. It's, it's a well-oiled machine, but I never worked on a TV show. I'm doing a movie, and we haven't started shooting until July 22nd. Oh. Um, preparation's been tough, though, but still been fun. If, if they're not fun, I won't do them anymore. And, and, and uh, that's what you have to strive for. You want to do things. Whatever it is you want to do, you have to love it. Maybe you want to teach. You have to love teaching. You want to be an editor, you have to love being an editor. I mean, whatever it is. So you feel as though you're really not going to work. Who's your favorite director you worked with and why? I have a couple of them. I love working with John McTiernan. Hunt Fred October, Die Hard, Die Hard uh, with a Vengeance. I did the Travolta movie with him. I did uh, the Thomas Crown Affair with Pierce Brosnan with him. I did one or two others with him. Um, he was an absolute genius. No matter what the problem was, I'd go to him and he'd figure out a way through the camera to, to resolve the problem. Um, so he was just a pleasure. He got himself in trouble. I had to go to jail. I mean, but still, he's one of the greatest directors I've ever worked with in my life. And I worked with Ridley Scott, Tony Scott. Uh, Tony Scott was wonderful too. Um, but Adrian Lyons is one of my other favorites. You know, he did Fatal Attraction and Flashdance, and I did Indecent Proposal with him. And um, he was another one of my favorites. And I guess John Landis is up there, too. Um, and he did some, you know, Blues Brothers, all those big movies, and a great guy. Um, but I would say John McTiernan is still number one. Not really. Do you think that producing could lead to directing? That's a good question. I, I really don't know. Um, Akiva Goldsman, who's a brilliant writer, Academy Award winning writer, uh, he wrote uh, the Russell Crowe movie, what the hell is his name? Beautiful Mind. Beautiful Mind. He, he, he was a brilliant writer, <clears throat> brilliant producer, he wrote so many wonderful things. Wrote uh, the Da Vinci Code. He wrote magnificent shows. And he said, "You know, now I want to direct." And he walked in the studio because he had such a great track record as a producer. They let him direct. Writer. Producer, writer. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Um, they let him. They let him direct. So in his case, yes. In others, most directors start off wanting to direct. Um, I don't really can't answer that question. But there's really an element of luck in everything. Uh, <clears throat> what's the most, uh, I guess, important skill for a producer to have? I think it's personality, actually. Once you learn the business, and you learn, and you have good story sense, and you don't waste money for no reason, and, and if you're just conscious of, of dollars and cents and story and, and compassion towards people, I think then it's, it's just having the right personality. I mean, I, I say that, but there's a lot of real pricks out there that are producing and making, doing very well for themselves. But, but guys like the brilliant, great producers out there, like Sean Levy, people like that, they have <laughs> wonderful personalities. They're wonderful human beings. But you have to learn the craft first. I think we talked about two more yes, questions. I read somewhere they were 
uh, opening up a production company here on Upper Kill Road somewhere? Do you I know? would have no idea, but I'll defer. It's the, uh, yeah, it's the one we're talking about. Talk about the jail. The oh, Tony Argento's place. He bought the jail. He bought the jail, and he's opening some sound stages. Yes. I think. Yeah. Is that still. Um, it's happening, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. so. What's the most important skill to be a good writer? To publish your stuff and to go. To publish it or. or well, most writers, I should say this, a lot of them don't. A lot of them have brilliant ideas, they have a great story, and they hire a ghostwriter or, or what we call a screenwriter who comes in and turns it into script format. But you could go on the internet and use um, Scriptor or Final Draft. There are certain programs that, that can show you how to, what slug lines, how to, you know, you, you don't even need to see numbers. What slug lines, and then you do your dialogue and descriptions. Henry. Um, so you mentioned that people generally don't care about your education so much where you're at now. I'm sorry I said that, but I would like to take that back. <laughs> Don't drop out. Do you think we would, as film students, be better off dropping out? No. <laughs> Even a dummy like me graduated from Wagner College, okay? No, absolutely not. You want to know why? Because it gives you self-confidence. You may not need it in the business, but you need it for yourself. And, and it really, it makes you feel good to know that you have that degree hanging on your wall. You told me they went to to Last question? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on the screenplay writing question. I think that's oh, you're writing a play, I see. It. No, no, not a screenplay. Okay. <laughs> he does. All right. <laughs> but what do you, what do you, so when a screenplay gets to you, if some, someone has an agent or whatever else, what's, what is it that, that makes a screenplay interesting? I know it's a ridiculous question because they're all different for different reasons, but maybe what's something that you think is, makes a screenplay original in some way? That I don't think there is an original screenplay anymore ever again. I think everything is, I mean, there's six stories and everything comes off all six over the history of time. Um, what makes it better than another? Just dialogue, uh, locations, a lot of things are involved. But we have a story department where they break down a script and they, they did a synopsis and I don't read the script. I, I shouldn't be saying this. I read the synopsis. If the synopsis is good and, and so we, we send the script to a studio. If they say it's good, then we read it. But he's kind of like my brains. <laughs> but, you know, it's be beginning, a middle, and an ending. In that order. In that order. Forget that. <laughs> and forget that. Forget the epilogue. I know, your husband's a screenwriter. So. <laughs> um, so, you've worked with, uh, with uh, writer, director. Yes. Can you talk about that? How is, is that a different process? Or are they more protective of their work? They're unbelievably protective of their work. I mean, every, Ocean's 8, right? the writer was also the director, right? Yeah, Gary yeah. Ross. But, uh, you know, everything was gold. So, how do you deal? How do you, how are you diplomatic about that? Because obviously, you have to work with the director. Let's shoot it your way. <laughs> then we'll shoot it our way, say, or the studio way, or my way. But let's always do it your way. And then, it, you know. I do it this way. If there's time left in a day, let's just do both versions. You look at it in the editing room. You're the, you're the director. You tell me what's best. But then you have that coverage. That, that works with actors, too. Right? We want to do it. Yeah. Actors. <laughs> Here's what I'm going to leave you with. There are three kinds of people in the world. Men, women, and actors. And don't ever forget that. Okay, folks, I think that's all we have time for, so thank you so much. For My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. I love Wagner.